There you go. That's a very exciting slide. So um, this is the last session of the day, uh, the last session of a week, the last session of what, for me, has been an extremely exhausting time, even though uh, if I look at the timesheet that I've submitted to my office, I haven't done anything very much. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure that everyone else is less exhausted than I am. Is that right? No. no. no okay. <laughs> so um, I know that last year, and last year I had to duck out quickly. I'm also going to have to duck out quickly this year because I live in Scotland. And Scotland uh, is an important part of the United Kingdom still, apparently. Um, <laughs> but it's quite hard to get to from Bristol on a Saturday afternoon. Um, last year, I left in the middle of Herb Sutter's explosive endnote. Um, apparently, the questions went on for an hour and a half after uh, he finished. Um, I will not be taking questions, because I will be out that door as Russell closes up. However, I don't imagine there'll be that many questions. If, however, you would like to get in touch with me, there's a Twitter handle in the bottom corner on that site. There's a, a, a URL um, for cucumber.io at this side. My name is Seb. Seb at cucumber.io will also get me um, you know, in a more private fashion than, than Twitter will. So if you've got comments or questions, please feel free to get in touch. Um, has anyone read the description of this, this session? No. no. That's, that's fairly typical, which is fine, which, which means that I can deviate from it uh, freely. Uh, I'm not going to deviate from it particularly much, actually. So one of the things that uh, I will not be doing is I'm not going to leave you with your head exploding like Herb did. So I'm going to t I promise to take you on a, gr a gentle walk through the south, south of France. Um, I would also promised a little bit of red wine, um, some unit testing, some continuous integration, various other bits and pieces. So let's see where we go. Um, the reason, or the, the background of this is that um, I have learned vast amounts uh, about developing software from my interaction with Accu over the past 21 years, right? Accu has been running a conference since 1997. Uh, in the middle, when I thought I was going to be an organic farmer, I stopped coming for a couple of years. But apart from that failed experiment, I've been here at every conference. Uh, and it, you know, I, what I do today, which is not what I did back in the, in the late 90s, I wouldn't be doing if it hadn't been for Aku. And in fact, oh, I've, got, I've got a wonderful opportunity here to do something that I've wanted to do for decades. So uh, Francis, would you please stand up? Could we all please say thank you to Francis for founding this organization? So without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, pepper this talk with um, references to other talks that I've seen over the past week. So first off, I've had to change this title based on a session that uh, Giovanni Asproni did this afternoon. So I noticed, as he went through the things that were about software architecture, that this is really not a talk about software development. It's actually a talk about software architecture. So there we go. We've renamed it to start with. Um, the next thing is, uh, back in 1996, when I joined Aku, I had already decided that I wanted to walk across France. Walking a, a long distance takes a long time. Uh, and uh, I bought a pair of boots. And I never actually got to use them walking across France. I went walking in Scotland. I went walking in England a little bit. Uh, in the 25 years that I didn't walk across France, I wore those boots out. Um, those boots no longer exist in this world. Uh, their sole actually has fallen off, and they've been recycled. The thing is, trying to find time in a busy life to go and put maybe three or four weeks into walking across a country for no particularly good reason. You know, if I was a BBC television presenter and they were paying me to walk across France, that's fine. But I've got a job, I had a family, uh, you know, all these things happen. And most of us have exactly these constraints. And what I want to think about is how, how, can, we, um, how can we work around those constraints and still get better at what we're doing, still do the things that we love, uh, and generally improve as human beings uh, working in the world. Now, um, I was lucky that, uh, well, I am lucky that I work for a company that I actually also partly own. So when I told them I'm taking September off last year, 
they said, I guess we have to say that's OK. <laughs> that's cool. Um, uh, so I, t I said I was going to take September off. I decided I was going to walk across France. My wife said that's fine. My children uh, have already left home, not because I decided to walk across <laughs> France. Um, and, and so everything was good. Uh, now, I'm going to use the rest of this session to talk about the journey across France, that whole expedition, and have an, create an analogy to software uh, architectures, to software projects particularly. So all projects start with some form of scope. Right? So I'm talking about the scope of walking across France. Now, France is quite a big country. Has anyone not been to France? A few people. So uh, take it from me. It's a big country. <laughs> uh, this is a map of France. Great, OK? Um, the map is not the territory, obviously. This is a specific version of a map of France, an IGN map of the Grand Rondonnet of France. So France is absolutely crisscrossed with dedicated footpaths, marked footpaths, for people to walk across France. There are 60,000 kilometers of them. So if that was my scope, you know, I've got a lot of walking to do. Uh, three weeks is not going to be enough, I mean, I, even if I walk quite fast. <laughs> so um, we have to narrow that scope down. This, however, is a problem that most product development organizations have, which is we can do loads of things. If you take a bundle of people that have domain knowledge and your customers, your stakeholders, you put them in a room and you have a sort of uh, product brainstorming, you come out with a massive list of things that uh, people would like you to do. Has anyone had that problem? <laughs> yeah, it's a regular problem. How do we narrow it down? Well, often what I see in organizations is that they narrow it down by coming up with or they, do, they sort of um, try and get a list of features that they want to develop. Sometimes they call it a minimum viable list of features, but in, typically it's just a list of features. And then they put it in a, an ordered list, and they call it a roadmap. This is a map. What they're doing is a, a list. Or as a, a colleague of mine, Goiko Adjik, described it, he said it's a tunnel. <laughs> so most product roadmaps are absolutely not maps. They're tunnels. So uh, here I have a map. This, this is the large-scale map. It's really hard to even pick the routes that you want to walk on from this map because, in fact, this doesn't have the 60,000 kilometers on it. It just shows the major arterial walking paths. We'll see some of the more detailed maps later. So you have to try and constrain scope. Uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm using a, a satellite view, Google Earth. Uh, this particular point here is nowhere special. It's a village called Sarabash that none of you have ever heard of uh, in the mountains above a town called Joyeuse, which probably none of you have ever heard of, uh, in a forest uh, called the Ardèche. Lovely place, and I happen to have that marker there because a friend of mine lives there. So I thought, well, let's, I haven't seen him in 10 years. I'm going to walk through the south of France. This gives me a lot of possibility to go through the Cévennes and the Ardèche. We've got uh, a, a lot of nice uh, southern things down here. Uh, Lyon is at the top where there's an airport. Uh, down at the bottom, there's Perpignan, which also has an airport. So, you know, I'm beginning to constrain the scope. That's typically what we do in projects as well. We try and find things that we, you know, something that we have expertise in, something we have knowledge about, something that would be useful and will deliver some sort of value. So we begin to constrain the scope a little bit. Uh, then I did what, uh, what, this is the equivalent of going and ser searching for a solution to a problem on Stack Overflow. So I went, does, has anyone walked around the south of France before? Well, there's 60,000 kilometers of paths, so yes, of course they have. So I did some searching, and there's, sure enough, there's a walking company that had done a walk in the south of France. And he published this path. Um, I had no intention of walking with this walking company, but it's great to have this path. So this is essentially, this was the architecture of my product. So this is an open source architecture, a walking skeleton. It, I'm not going to walk along this particular path, but it gives me a flavor of what I can do. And there's some really interesting things along here. So this bit, uh, which starts at a place called Port La Nouvelle, it runs along something called the, uh, the Cathar Trail. Has anyone, remember, has anyone heard of the Cathars? Mm -hmm. uh, they were, is it right to say apostates or heretics back in the 15th century, 16th century? Anyway, um, being apostates, they, uh, uh, they suffered from persecution. And one of the things that people did in those days when they suffered from persecutions, they built bloody great big castles on the top of every high point. 
So there's lots of wonderful castles along there. So I had the possibility of getting some wonderful castles, which we could think of some really excellent features in our product. There you go. You see the, it's a weak, uh, a weak analogy that's getting weaker. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then you keep going up. And actually, there's some brilliant stuff around here, which I'm going to talk about later. And then afterwards, you've got some amazing forests. So constrained. More constraint. Uh, my month off turned into three weeks off, which turned into two and a half weeks off-ish. Um, but at least I had, you know, I, I had some time off. So I've got some fixed, uh, fixed deadlines. I knew when I was arriving uh, in Perpignan, and I knew where I had to be in Lyon to get back. And you know, uh, I guess they, I, we could have thought that I could get another ticket if I missed any of those deadlines. Unfortunately, uh, you have commitments, don't you? So I had to get back. So now I've got some very fixed time deadlines, which is also something that most of you have probably experienced in your professional lives. What do you do when you've got a fixed time deadline and a huge list of functionality which the product owner says must all be delivered? Well, you could get more people. Um, when, did that, when did that last work? I'd really, actually, I would love to see if anyone here has ever um, bucked uh, Fred Brooks's law and actually delivered on time by increasing the number of people on a project. Yeah? OK, we have one. We'll, uh, Claire will speak about this later, or maybe even next year, <laughs> that, which would be a good thing. So um, I, I, I had some deadlines that I needed to get back to. So now we've got a project. We've got a, br you know, a very broad scope that still needs to be narrowed down. I work typically in agile methodologies. And so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and hit a deadline by managing scope. I'm going to prioritize certain things. Um, but I'm still expecting not to deliver all the things I was going to set out to deliver when I, when I started, because I'm going to learn stuff. Things are going to change along the way. Quite often at the beginning of a, a project, the first thing you want to set up is you know, the, your ways of working, the technology stack you're going to use, the tooling that you want to um, play around with. And I don't know about the, the rest of you, but that's often the most fun bit, where you get to tinker with things and uh, try out new uh, approaches. And oh, I'm going to try this latest version uh, of GCC with Schrodinger's catch. Do we have Jonathan here? No. Oh, well. <laughs> so technology. Um, here I'm going to just blatantly bore you, right? So I, I, when I, when I walk, used to do camping and walking, you know, I had the constraints of walking around Scotland. And I was only going on one, two day trips. Um, here I was planning to walk um, in France uh, in the autumn uh, on my own for you know, two and a half weeks. And so all the technology that I already had in my attic was no use anymore, theoretically anyway. So I'm going to just go through the, uh, with a bit of camping kit. So do we have any camping nerds in the house? A few, OK. Well, let's see whether you th what you think of this stuff. I'm going to go through it quite quickly, because obviously this isn't a camping session. So first thing, obviously, you need a sleeping bag. If you're going to go camping, you need a sleeping bag. Um, this is a small sleeping bag. It's a, a two-season sleeping bag. It costs 29 pounds. I didn't know you could get sleeping bags for as little as that. So that was good. It weighs 1.1 kilos. Not very much. This, however, was revolutionary. So has anyone ever walked around, and done any camping with uh, one of those expanded foam uh, sleeping mats? Yeah. yeah. They're quite bulky, right? They're not particularly heavy, but they're very, very bulky. Then about 10, 15 years ago, you start getting self-inflating mats. So they're a bit heavy, but they compress down a lot more. And you would, you would undo a valve. They would sort of um, self-inflate. And then you would sleep on them until they punctured. <laughs> this was a revolution, right? So this is, a, this is just under 300 grams. And it is actually about this big in the packaging. It comes with a dry sack. And a dry sack is a, a bag which, uh, when you flip the top over, uh, things inside it stay dry. So when you're camping, this is also a good thing. This dry sack has an extra benefit. Um, down here, so some of you will be able to see it. I won't walk off the stage. Um, there's a valve. So you pop it out, and now you've got a valve. Then you plug it into your mat and you pump your mat up. <laughs> awesome, right? 
four pumps and you're ready to go to bed. So one, 1,100 grams plus 300 grams, or about 1.4 kilos just now, you need a tent. 500 grams. Packs down to this size. Comes without any pulls or pegs. <laughs> but you see this pull? It's a walking stick. Right? These people are thinking. <laughs> this is product design. This is awesome. So you have to buy your own pegs and a pole. This actually is quite an interesting place as well. Because when you become an ultralight camping nerd, you've got a lot of choices of pegs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought you could pay 15 quid for a titanium peg that weighs less than a gram? Or you can pay five quid for nine pegs. Anyway, I'm a, I, I spent my budget on tents and sleeping mats. So these were the cheapers. I then went and bought a 20 liter rucksack. Again, super light. This is tiny. All my stuff fitted inside it. I was going to be able to leave and walk across France with less than 10 kilos on my back. Uh, because, you know, I'm lazy. I didn't want to carry 25 kilos. This was really good. However, we all know that just getting the kit does not make you good with it, <laughs> right? So you can buy the fastest compilers and the shiniest machines. You can even hire the cleverest programmers. But unless you all work well together, you're still going to deliver rubbish slowly. So you need to practice. So I practiced packing that rucksack, because actually, as you might have seen, it, it wasn't floppy. It was full. I practiced seeing whether things would go in different positions. I knew that I was going to have to access various parts of my kit throughout the day, and I didn't want to, want to have to unload everything and go to the bottom. So uh, the, I'm not going to show you a picture or a video of me putting up a tent, because that would have been too much fun. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to plug my second most favorite tool, which is CyberDojo. <laughs> so is there anybody here who has never used CyberDojo? OK. So John Jagger, who's gone, is the creator and maintainer of CyberDojo. CyberDojo is a charity. Um, it's a charity that uh, takes, uh, it has sponsorship from other organizations. It uh, also sells licenses to companies that use it internally for training. And every penny of that money goes towards buying Raspberry Pis that get shipped to schools around the world. Right? So it's, it's a really good place to be in the first place. It's also an awesome training environment. It's a training environment specifically designed to teach teams of people test-driven development. It's great if you run training because you have zero setup. It's a web-hosted environment. There's about 60 languages there with pretty much any test environment that you can think of. It also ships with about 60 or 70 carters that you can work with. So I really strongly encourage you to have a go with it because it's, it's totally useful. And it has some beautiful things like a dashboard. So you see this one here that says review a practice. So if you have half a dozen different groups all working in the same practice, and you then decide to press review, you get a dashboard, and you see how all six of them are doing. And you can then go back to every commit that they've done and step through their evolution. So you can use it as a training. Uh, well, that's what it's for. It's a really good training tool. But the reason I'm showing it here is because of the FAQ, which is, again, John is a, is a very funny guy. And this is his FAQ. Because it's a web-hosted environment, it doesn't have much functionality in it beyond the fact that it invokes the compilers, uh, invokes the runtime environment, runs the tests, and shows you the results. So people keep saying, why doesn't it do refactoring? And John's response is, no, listen. Stop trying to go faster. Start trying to go slower. Don't think about finishing. Think about improving. Think about practicing as a team. Right, so when I'm walking across France, I'm not practicing as a team. But one of the things that will really, really make a walk anywhere depressing <laughs> and not enjoyable is thinking, I need to get there by this time, by this date. I really have to hurry. And that's the same with a lot of the technologies that we're using. We have to actually give ourselves the time to learn them, to practice with them, to get good with them. Because if we don't give ourselves the time, what we end up with is shiny tools that we just use like we used the old tools that we've replaced them with. 
they don't give us the benefit. So practice makes perfect. Don't rush that practice. Learning is not something that you can force. You have to take your time for it. Who likes documentation? I like documentation. Who has ever worked with documentation that was less than perfect? <laughs> right. So, thought experiment. If you have a choice between no documentation or bad documentation, which would you prefer? No, no documentation. Yet, what sort of documentation have you got? Bad documentation. Right. So there's an issue here, isn't there? There's, this is a problem that we, as, an, as a community, really understand. We experience it on a day-by-day -day basis. And what have we done about it? Have you ever seen a document which has got a cover sheet that has been signed off by six individuals? Did that mean it was correct? No, no exactly. <laughs> so, so the trouble with documentation is that it's dead, right? Nobody actually wants to review it. People want to consume it, uh, but they only want to consume the bit that's important to them at that moment in time. So you know the Stack Overflow problem, where right? you, you go, you ask a question, and the, typically, 90% of Stack Overflow users will take the first answer that they see on the page, because there's no way they're even going to read the comments and see whether someone else has said that's a bad idea. We just go straight for the first thing. So um, this is not a talk that I'm going to plug uh, Cucumber as such, but uh, both uh, the Cucumber tool, Fit and Fitness, and various other frameworks allow you to write documentation that executes your software and will be run as part of your build and will tell you if your documentation has diverged from the implementation that you're shipping. You've got documentation that tells you when it's wrong. Now, let's just assume you believe me. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. So check out Fit, Fitness, Cucumber. They all work with C++. This is the documentation that I want to talk about. This is the more detailed um, maps that the French, it's like the French Ordnance Survey provide. And as you can see, they're much smaller. They cover not the whole of France. So you need to take a few of them, even for the limited journey that I was going on. Have you, has anyone tried walking long distances using a map? Is that always easy? Let's put it another way. Have you ever got lost? Yeah. 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 Hell yeah. So, so the world has changed since the last time I traveled uh, lightweight in that I actually had a mobile phone with GPS on it, so I could roughly tell at most points where I was. And in fact, France, um, unlike Scotland, has got wonderful 4G coverage even when there's nobody about, right? <laughs> you, know, you, you can see trees for 20 miles in every direction, and you still get five bars of 4G. So I had the maps, but it turned out that the GPS itself, the maps that you could see didn't show you the paths that you were walking on. So there's no online version of these. So it, together, they could kind of help, but it wasn't enough. But these guys, they're, they're not stupid. So the Grand Rondonné have proper documentation on them. This is like code comments, you know, like tell you what to do. So this says, keep going this way. You're, you're doing fine. This says. Don't go this way, right? <laughs> this says you've got to turn right, and there's obviously the opposite that says turn left. So at that point, you go, ah, perfect French documentation. Wonderful. <laughs> and these are some examples of some perfect French documentation. So here, this one says go over this gate post. Here we have, um, yep, well, this one's not so simple, but nonetheless, it was keep going down this path. And down here in the corner, we've got don't go down this path. So that's simple enough, right? Now, this is a real world example, right? So you're walking down a path and you go, right, this way or that way? Well, actually, don't go this way, OK? Right, good. You can go this way. And then just to make sure, make it clear that, that life isn't even that simple, what is that, right? I think it's don't chop this tree down, okay? So it has nothing to do with the path. 
but also you have things like this. So I'm sorry. So this is like documentation I've seen, right? This is like, has anyone come across safe? This looks like a safe diagram to me. Well, you, you, safe has a wonderful thing where you take, you take your whole team, like 60 or 70 people, you hire a sports hall, you get brown paper on the wall, and you give people large rolls of string, and they spend two very expensive days uh, pinning lines of string together, and they still don't know what they're doing, which is what that says to me. <laughs> This one, th this one, they're trying very hard, but it's just confusing. What about this one? That, that, is, that is like wikis the world over, isn't it? You know, <laughs> under construction. Right? And then finally, this is just dangerous, isn't it? What does that mean? That's frightening. We've got a sign saying going this way, a gate, but what's it gate in? And then what on earth has gone on here? <laughs> so um, this room, last night in the in this lightning talks. Um, I, I would watch uh, Timur do, talk about how this how, bizarre things that are uh, legal but not very useful in C++. And th this makes me think of that. It's like, yes, but what am I supposed to do? It actually turns out that there was a fire here. Um, and grass grows back, but fences don't. <laughs> Next. Um, so here we are. We've, we've got to do some planning. We've got some scope. I've got my technology all set up. I probably, you know, I'm, I'm ready to start thinking about, uh, you know, detailed planning for my expedition for my project. And you'll recall this was the map that I stole from Stack Overflow or OpenSourceArchitecture.com or whatever it was. Okay. These are typical paths. Uh, these are pictures that I took while I was walking. And although they are very different. You can think, well, they're kind of flat. They're fairly easy going. I mean, this one's a bit more lumpy than these two, but you could just walk down them, right? And for those of you that, have, that know me, and a lot of you do, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of estimates. OK, maybe not that many of you do know me, right? <laughs> so um, when you're trying to think about how much of this am I going to be able to cover in the 19 days that I had, you have to think about how fast am I going to walk? How fast do you walk? It Sorry? It, depends. it does depend, but let, let's, let's play it a little bit until we get to the it depends bit. So typically on a flat like this, you can walk at, you know, fairly steadily at three and a half miles an hour. Probably a bit faster. And so if you're going to walk for eight or 10 hours a day, you should be able to cover you know, 30 miles a day. Has anyone ever walked 30 miles in a day? No. Yes. Uh, yeah. Was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it hurts, doesn't it? It's, it's not something you're typically going to do. And especially down here, you probably wouldn't want to do that. So I thought, let's say I can walk 20 miles in a day. OK, that's still kind of aggressive on a day-by-day on a -day basis. But hey, I went for it as a sort of thought process. Um, and when I saw these sort of paths, it felt like that was maybe doable. However, um, that's not the only sort of path that a walking thing goes over. This actually, it's difficult to see steepness in a two-dimensional pictor pictographical representation. But you see that little sign there? That says the path is this way, right? <laughs> this one has a one there and then there. This is almost vertical. Uh, that one has one up here. That is uphill. So a lot of these paths, you're actually clambering. I mean, they're not climbing, but you're clambering. And at this point, an estimate of 20 miles a day becomes, well, first off, you're not going to do 20 miles. And the second is, which 20 miles? <laughs> is that 20 miles that you look on the map, or 20 miles of actually steps that you've walked? So I might have walked 20 miles, but I didn't get 20 miles from where I started. So this is the path that I came up with based on the fact that uh, I was you know, I knew I was going to, going to achieve it, but it seemed like a reasonable approximation of what I wanted to do. So this is, this is um, the route that I wanted to take. Uh, it was going to take me along the, the, Cathar, uh, the Cathar Trail, up through some really nice stuff, Ville Rouge Terminal is beautiful, to Carcassonne, which is a beautiful um, uh, fortified town near Toulouse. Um, this was going to be quite a steep run, and then that was going to be just awesome. I was pretty sure that there was no way that I was going to cover um, 461 kilometers in 104 hours. 
Uh, and in fact, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to cover it in 19 days either. But it was, a, it was a place to start, and I knew that because we were agile, and it's an agile project, I could manage scope. So uh, I had my tickets, I had my equipment, uh, I, I had my, my plan, my roadmap, shall we say, I, and uh, off I went. And so we move into the development phase, right? So this is where we're actually going to try and deliver some sort of functionality. We're gonna, do, we're gonna, we're gonna execute on our plan. Turns out that those lumpy bits that I was showing you, that was the less, least of my problems. <laughs> because as I mentioned, I think, the Cathars built their, hill, their, their castles on top of really big hills. And the path, because people that walk along the path want to go to all these cool castles, <laughs> goes up and down and up and down all day. So I don't know if this, if you can see, you know, this comes across in this sort of picture, but it's, these are really high. And actually some of them, you get up there and the wind is so strong, you don't think you're going to be able to stand up. And then you go, Phew, and you head down and then, and then the heat hits you as you hit the bottom. It's amazing. But it's, it, it's, it takes out of you. So, I did a couple of days walking along here, and there are three big hills up to Cathar Castles as you get come along here. And the last one is the Chateau de Pere Pertuse, which is a really famous one. Uh, and they were getting more, more wonderful as you went along. And I was always planning to turn up to go to Ville Rouge. But by the time I got to Ville Rouge, I was pretty sure that I was already at least four days behind schedule. You know? <laughs> and I was, I was only four days into the project. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so does that sound familiar? <laughs> because, because it sounds familiar to me. So, what do you do? You replan. So, uh, I used to work for a company that you may have heard of called IBM. Uh, and I did a lot of great stuff with IBM. In fact, IBM was the last time I actually worked in, in C++, where we, uh, where we tried to take a, a product that anyone who's ever used it has always hated, called Doors and move it from, yeah, exactly, and move it from a, um, a, a proprietary, uh, and I guess I say proprietary, that's the nicest thing you could possibly say about it, <laughs> a, a proprietary server protocol onto uh, Rational's wonderful new jazz platform, which was also awful. Anyway, <laughs> we did this for three days every month. Because we could never hit our estimates because we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> so I replanned. Now replanning here. <laughs> it involved motor transport. <laughs> so I, I, I do have some photographs of the motor transport. I actually. I, I, I am an inveterate hitchhiker, so I, ha I used to hitchhike in my youth. I haven't hitchhiked for 20 years, but uh, this was the best way of getting, making this journey. And I spent a Sunday hitchhiking from Lesignan to Lodev. Uh, and uh, uh, the first lift took me to the Péage at Narbonne. So any of you that have hitched, or even drive, driven around France, knows that there are Péages, which is where you pay to get onto the motorway. And once you're on the motorway, you go really fast. So I got picked up at this uh, payage at Narbonne by a couple of guys uh, wearing Burger King crowns, right? <laughs> <laughs> they had been at Narbonne soaking up the sun and they were on their way back to Paris and they were gay and happy and obviously they thought, we're French, we're going to celebrate with Burger King. <laughs> and you know, if, if there's anything that's gonna shatter your, you know, your, your vision of, uh, French, French uh, culinary exp expertise, it's Burger King. Anyway, so they got me to Lodev, uh, uh, at which point I was back on track. So you could maybe think of that, you could think about replanning, you could also think of it as outsourcing. It's possibly the most successful outsourcing I've ever done. <laughs> now I'm gonna take a bit of a, a diversion. So Lodev, Lodev is, is a town that, again, no one's probably ever heard of, um, and there's a very, very steep climb out of Lodev. Uh, and I got there, uh, it was about three o'clock, it was, it was mid-afternoon, as I said, it was a Sunday. Um, and on Sunday, does anyone know what the French do in the countryside on Sunday? <laughs> Sorry? Nothing. No, well, they probably do, but no. Sorry? 
No. Well, they do all those things. They kill things, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, they, they put on orange anoraks, and they stand in a line with guns, and they shout at pigs. And the pigs run towards them, and they try and shoot them. Right? And it makes it quite challenging to walk through the countryside on a Sunday. <laughs> No, exactly. It's really difficult to know whether to run away or towards the shouts. Anyway, so I went up this very steep place. I was kind of, I was, I, I was at tense, let's say. I was tense as I went up this path. Um, and then it just got, kept getting steeper and steeper. And it's one of those paths that was so steep that it turned into a switchback. And it kept going, and the, and the sun was beginning to go down. And I was wanting, I want to put my tent up. Uh, and, you know, this is like trying to find a point when you're in the flow and you are trying to check some code in. You know, you really want to stop, but this is not quite the right place. I'm not ready to commit just now. And I kept going, and I kept going, and the, the switchbacks kept getting steeper and steeper, and there was a, a little patch that looked like it almost might fit the tent, but ah. So I kept going, and I got to the top, and I arrived at this place. I thought, yes, this is where I'm going to check in. I've got all my tests are green. I've got a big flat space to, to start looking at my code. This is where I want to be. Um, mountains are made out of rock. <laughs> I could not get my tent pegs in anywhere. I tried all over this space. So at this point, I can say that it wasn't quite so much foresight, but luck. I had these two items in my bag. The knife, obviously, because you have to chop your cheese and your salami because you're in France. <laughs> this was 20 meters of paracord, which I just thought would be useful. I mean, obviously, the, uh, in 20 days and a small rucksack, uh, you probably don't have 20 changes of underwear. I certainly didn't. So you did a lot of, I did a lot of washing on the way. So I, I actually brought this paracord along because I thought I was going to need it for, um, oh, I did. I used it as a drying line. But in this particular case, it was just what I wanted. So I cut a seven lengths of this, tied it to where I put the pegs in my tent, and then I found rocks and tied it around the, the paracord and then put my tent up. Now, Boy Scout, go me. But equally, <laughs> has anyone? done really bizarre and inexplicable things with log files, <laughs> right? Yeah? All the time, yeah? What do we do with cron jobs? Well, we delete things that, we shouldn't, that shouldn't have been in there in the first place. We, as developers, as systems engineers, we continually take things and use them in bizarre and novel ways. So uh, earlier today, uh, I heard Chris Allward talking about using database as a queue. That's novel. You know, that's not typically what the database is supposed to be used for. So we need to be able to, uh, we need enough tools that are flexible enough for us to be able to solve problems without having to go out and always get the latest bespoke thing. So here we have, um, yeah, I was very happy with this. And in fact, the tent still sports these little tails of uh, paracord because uh, they're on so tightly now I can't get them off. No project um, goes the way you think it's going to go. Have you ever sat in a room with your project team once you've delivered something that everybody's happy with, and you have a sort of, maybe you, you have a, I don't know, maybe a debrief or a retrospective or just a project review, and you agree among yourselves that if you were to do that same project again, you'd do it exactly the same way. <laughs> no, because we learn. So there are some things that I learned along the way. And I, here, what, the bits that I want to talk about is this section from Lodev to Mondardier. So here I am. I'm, I'm to, I wake up on top of the hill. Uh, and I know I've got this thing called Navacell ahead of me. Not quite sure what it is, because I haven't done that much research, which is also quite typical of many projects. Um, and it was amazing. It's an awesome awesome uh, valley that's been eroded by a river. There's oxbow lakes. There's... It's just amazing. Thing is, I was on one side of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I needed to get to the other. 
there were some amazing <laughs> geological formations in there. So, I mean, it was a full day's walk, uh, and I was entranced the whole day. So there's wonderful stuff like this. There's also serious engineering. So the, on the side of this, uh, uh, this valley, the French have built a canal. That's quite wide. That covers, that takes water 12 kilometers down to a hydro station at the bottom of the valley that was built in 1902 and is still running today. It's just insane. And uh, it keeps going in and out of um, uh, little tunnels uh, that have somehow been stuck onto the side. And here, this was an easy bit because I could walk next to it, but you could see down the valley, it was actually just clinging to the side of the, the rock. Um, and although you can't see it here, there are signs that say, danger of death. <laughs> Do not go swimming, right? <laughs> right so. Then I got to the other end, and I, I'd already here, at this point, I'd climbed out. So there's a lovely village at that end. I'd stopped and had a cup of coffee, as you do, and I climbed out up the switchback paths right to the top, and I was uh, greeted by this sign in English and Fringlish. <laughs> I mean, in French and Fringlish. Uh, so, hiker following this, this, uh, this path, sports and delicate passages, strong slope, fallen rocks, impracticable, impracticable to mountain bikers and horse riders, possible variant by the road. So here it's offering, you say, you're either going up a really steep, rocky path, or you're going to go along the road, in which case, watch out, because there are drivers. <laughs> um, so I went up the top, I went over the top, and it really was quite quite an extra up after getting out of that rift valley. Uh, and I was in, I think I'd been walking for 10, 11 hours at that point, and I was tired, and I twisted my ankle. I know. Two days I spent in this campsite. I was the only person there. <laughs> it was in a village, and there didn't seem to be anybody in the village except for two excellent restaurateurs. It was amazing. So um, <laughs> it was just this little cafe, uh, and they did um, menu de midi, so uh, gastronomic three-course lunches for, 50, for 15 euros, including wine. Thank you very much. So, so it, it was a real hardship, and I'm glad you went, oh. But, but it was OK. Two days later, actually, they didn't have any ice. That was the downside. So um, to try and, and they didn't have a chemist either. There really was nothing there apart from this, this restaurant and a, a small um, tobacconist. And the tobacconist, they had ice, but they had ice in those big um, one, two kilogram sacks. And I was on a campsite with no freezer. So instead, I, I, twice a day, I would go in, and I would buy a popsicle and stuff it down my sock <laughs> to, try and, to try and chill off um, uh, the, the, the soreness. Anyway. Guess what? It's time to replan. I've lost another two days. Um, uh, my ankle is getting better, but it's still a bit weak. Uh, I travel down. Uh, you know, it's, it's, now I can walk on it. So I travel down into the nearest town and get some uh, ibuprofen. Uh, Advil, I think, is the American translation. So to, to try and uh, pull off on the, um, uh, uh, on the swelling. And uh, now I'm, um, <laughs> ah, yes. So this is not a motorway. So for those of you who haven't hitchhiked, again, you know, you, you're learning so many useful things here today. <laughs> Hitchhiking on small roads requires you to get lots of short lifts. Yep. If you try and go a long way on, a, on a, anything apart from a motorway, uh, you are just going to be waiting for a very long time. And I had a wonderful day. I met, I met half a dozen people, and every single conversation I had was excellent. I met a welder who was making sectional houses, uh, and currently he was working at a Buddhist mo monastery in installing them, which is a beautiful conversation. Um, I met a, a, an African guy who was heading off uh, to try and get a job as an HGV driver, and we had a long and detailed conversation about brands of whiskey. So I'm, <laughs> who would have thought it? Anyway, so I'm, I'm going a very short distance. It, takes, it do, does take half a day, but I get to the place in the end, um, and we're really, I'm on, the, I'm on the last hall now. I'm heading towards uh, the end of my, my, my uh, project. I've got to the beginning of that, the walk through the woods, and it's kind of plain sailing. You know that feeling when it's kind of plain sailing? Your deployment, your, you've done the work, you've, you've got through the challenges, you've um, 
you've maybe reduced your scope, but you've got something that you've shown to the customer, you've shown to your product owner, they're kind of happy with it. You're thinking about, well, now we need, to, um, we need to wrap it up, we need to make sure that it can be deployed correctly, we can get it out to the users. You might have some integration testing, yeah, which is always kind of fun, isn't it? So it's quite a long deployment. I always like to give myself a long time for that sort of bringing everything together. IBM, where I was talking about earlier, um, we took three months to bring different things together. And that typically wasn't long enough. Anyway, so I've got 130 kilometers to go, but it's actually a straight line. It's on really nice, easy forest paths. There was no steepness. I was in the swing of things. I was, I was actually getting really good at using my walking stick to keep the weight off my, off my ankle. So off we went, and this is the sort of thing we were walking through. And it just was beautiful. I felt like we had something to deploy. And then I hit Leon. And you know, when you get, when you get that, your, that, that night of the deployment where it goes live, when the phone rings, or when uh, your boss says, it's OK. Stay late, I'll call in for Chinese, right? <laughs> no, don't want that. But that's what has happened. Uh, and so we had some, I had a couple of long days to get there. There was one day when um, I had to get, I wanted to get to a particular way marker. It was a, essentially a release plan, a, a, um, a label. Uh, and it took a 12 hour haul. Uh, and in the end you got there and it was like, oh, I just need to go to sleep now. And then in the end, you have your, pro your party, your release party. You sit around with guitars and wine, um, late into the night, feeling like you've achieved something, <laughs> and knowing that you're going to have to start doing it all again tomorrow, <laughs> which I didn't, which is good. And at that point in a project, you have to start thinking about how did it go? What could we have done better? How will we do it better next time? What have we learned? What should we have learned? We had some conversations about this in some se sessions. Um, so I think yesterday we talked about it. Uh, um, Felix was talking about how to make your organization better. And people were talking about wikis and um, blogging and just trying to capture that knowledge. Um, I actually, I don't know whether you've been noticing, but I, I use something called Blip Photo, where once a day I reflect on what I did yesterday, how, how things went. And I think that's a useful thing for all teams to do. But it's not enough. So in a team within an organization, you learn things on a regular basis. And if you don't capture them in some way that is findable by people that come after you, that knowledge actually gets lost. So wikis have been around now for quite a long time, and people love them. but. A wiki is a bit like a JIRA ticket, which means no one ever reads it again, and no one ever updates it, <laughs> and no one ever can find the information that you put there. Even you can't find the information that you put there. So we have to be more structured about learning things. Right at the beginning, or near the top of this talk, I talked about, um, uh, I talked about documentation. And I was talking about uh, fitness and, and cucumber, because that's executable documentation. But even before that, there's documentation around the tests that I write within my code. This is something that I, you know, I know that a lot of you uh, will be aficionados of unit testing. And there was a conversation yesterday uh, at a session around uh, code reviews where people, uh, there was a discussion about what is the point of uh, automated unit tests. And the answer there for me is, it needs to act as documentation for people that come after us. I actually don't care if the code has defects in it, because I expect the unit test to catch that. What I want the unit test to be is readable and understandable. And so when I, do a, uh, when I coach people on doing code reviews, I do not want to have lots of people in the room. In fact, I don't want the person who has uh, created the pull request to explain anything. Because if they have to explain something, then they haven't documented it. 
So for me, it's the unit test that goes with the pull request, or the unit tests that go with the pull request, that are most important. I want developers to be able to understand exactly what that pull request is about by reading the unit tests. And only if they can understand that should they ever even think about delving into the code. Because until I'm told, until it's been documented and designed, I don't want to waste time uh, saying your braces are wrong or your const is in the wrong position. So um, one of my uh, you know, inspirations is um, Dan North. And Dan North, uh, is, he's a London-based London consultant. Uh, he <coughs> coined the term behavior-driven development. Uh, you'll see him talking all over the place. Uh, he wrote this really excellent blog post, and back in 2010 now, uh, called Introducing Deliberate Discovery. A lot of what we do uh, is about trying to learn things. I, I asked you earlier uh, whether you'd ever been in a project retrospective where people had said uh, we'd do it exactly the same way. The answer is no, because you always discover something while you are trying to deliver it. The trouble with discovering things while you're trying to deliver it is that it's inefficient. You're in the middle of something and you've done something wrong. You have to go and ask someone questions. You have to go and re-resource something and do replanning. The right place, the best place to discover uh, things that you don't know is before you start. Deliberate discovery. And deliberate discovery doesn't say you can discover everything because that would obviously be crazy. But what deliberate discovery says is that if you admit to yourself that even though you are an expert in so many things, you don't know everything, that gives you permission to ask questions and say to each other, well, I don't know. This is important because what we are trying to do, when, when our customers come to us and say they want more faster, when they say they want a higher velocity, what they're really saying is they want their ideas to be delivered more quickly. <coughs> And it's throughput that they want there. Velocity is just a lagging indicator of how good you are at delivering functionality. So ignorance is a problem. Uh, Dan likes his long words. So he goes on to say that ignorance is multivariate, which is you're not just ignorant in one way. You're ignorant in lots of different ways, um, in, at different speeds. Because he says it's also nonlinear and disjoint discovery. So that means. You can't just discover everything all at once. You don't discover things in a constant stream of, of time. Um, and that you, will, you might go for a period where you discover very little because you're in an area that you're very comfortable with and you understand. So this is an extremely interesting blog post. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to take a look at it uh, in your own time. And now, given that this is in the section on reflection, I would like to ask uh, my glamorous assistants to distribute index cards to the room. So uh, Brian, Byron and Fran, and maybe you need to hand it out to other people. Uh, so there are some index cards coming around. And while you're waiting to for them to come, please think to yourself about one thing that you have learnt while you're at ACU this year that you would like to try out at work when you get back there next week. And then when you get the card, please write it on the card. One thing that you want to use from the, that you have learned at this conference this week. And if you don't get a card, I'm sure you, some of you have paper. It's, it's quite all right to use anything. The card is not particularly magic. So what I'd like you to do is I would like you to write this one thing that you want to try out on one side of the piece of paper. And on the other side of the piece of paper, I would like you to write a work email address. And then I would like you to exchange your piece of paper with somebody in the room that you do not know. And I am going to ask you to be accountable to the, whoever you exchange paper to, to email them in two weeks' time and say, how did you get on? Is that going to be OK? At which point, 
Um, while you're doing that, I think this is an excellent time for me to hand over to Russell to say thank you to, to Francis for starting the ACU, uh, to, to Russell for organizing the conference, and to all of the speakers who did uh, such an excellent job, and to all of you for coming along. So, thank you.